Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from U.S. West, providing advanced telecommunication services to New Mexico homes and businesses, and by New Mexico Tech on the frontier of science and engineering education. For bachelor's, master's, and Ph.D. degrees, New Mexico Tech is the college you've been looking for. 1-800-428-TECH. Report from Santa Fe was honored to do one of the last television interviews granted by Clyde Tombaugh. Professor Emeritus at New Mexico State University, who in 1930 discovered the planet Pluto. Initially self-educated, Professor Tombaugh was a giant in the field of astronomy, a humble man with a marvelous sense of humor. It has been said a poet has the capacity to make the quantum leap to the stars and planets. Clyde Tombaugh, who died January 17, 1997, at the age of 90, was such a poet. The following program, originally broadcast in July of 1996, is lovingly dedicated to his memory. I'm Ernie Mills, and this is Report from Santa Fe Today from Las Cruces, New Mexico, the home of Patsy and Clyde Tomba. Professor Tomba, I've been waiting a long time to do this show with you. Thank you. I, I have talked to a lot of people. They all have their own stories about you. I have my own. We'll talk about a couple of them. But what I'd really like to talk about today is if we can go back to that period when the Kansas farm boy came to New Mexico. Why don't you pick it up from there and, and tell us okay. about yourself? Well, of course, I was born in Illinois in uh, 1906, and uh, my father was a farmer, corn farmer. And then the family moved to uh, Western Kansas in 1922 when I was 16. And I lived there, and I cut, helped, I cut several thousand acres of wheat in my younger days. And then I made these telescopes. And, I, and so I made drawings of Mars and Jupiter through my nanny, she went out there, and uh, the markings on them, sent them to the little observatory to see what they'd think of them. Well, they were impressed, apparently, because they could compare them for actually with their current photographs on those dates. So uh, after a couple of letters, he asked, well, he asked some questions on me, and after a couple of letters, he invited me to come to Flagstaff one three months trial to operate a new photographic telescope they were installing. Now, what uh, year was that? Can you read that? That was 1928, the letters, and then I went there and I went to the observatory in 1929, January, middle of January, 1929. Now, what, what was it that got you interested in, in the stars and in, in space? Well, when I, when I was in the lower grades, I had a very strong interest in geography as a hobby, geography. Then the one day, in about the sixth grade, the idea occurred to me, what would the geography be like on the other planets? We, now, your wife, Patsy, mentioned to me that she had talked to a lady one time, mm -hmm. and the lady said, I don't think God wants us messing around in space. And Patsy sort of indicated to her that maybe God does want us mm -hmm. to know what's going on on these other planets. But that basically, wanting to know what was going on there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is what inspired you. Yeah. And when I talk to people and say, well, they'll tell me Clyde, you know, they'll say, let me tell you my Clyde Tumbaugh story. The one thing that's impressed me is that you talked to me once, almost as you would a child, explaining something to me. But it's your relationship, you know, when you talk to youngsters and children. On the way to your home, uh, we passed the uh, Clyde W. Tomba Elementary School. Children come to see mm -hmm. you. On your 90th birthday, mm -hmm. you receive letters and email from all, all over the world. The world. Mm -hmm. you know, if, if you were talking to youngsters today, what would you want them to know about the future? Well, I think they should uh, uh, work at it, be industrious, don't waste your time in gangs and stuff like that, a crime, because that only gets them in trouble. If they have stuff they don't want, to, if they don't have anything to do, go to the library and read something, learn something. Uh, the person gets a good job with people who learn and know something. And if they don't do it, you're going to take the lesser jobs. No. And they should be uh, understand that. When I have never been able to understand, there was one book that you wrote yourself, mm -hmm. and working also with a uh, with an English author, mm -hmm. that uh, English writer, and uh, that's out of print. But yes, that, it is. That book itself, uh, I couldn't imagine why he wouldn't have printed an extra fifty thousand copies or so. But 
it, ex it explains in detail exactly mm -hmm. how it was done. How you explored the plan? Can you can you tell us how it was? Well, done? I was planning to do that later because I they were beginning to get some of the probes out to other planets and so on, and they were also making uh, some discoveries with other instruments on Pluto and learn more about it. So I thought I'd wait a few years and bring it up to date. But that but it came in so fast it overloaded. I just gave up. Now this is 1930. Well, that, yeah, but the. Uh, <laughs> I was thinking about the things that were being learned in the 40s and 50s. Not a great deal, but some. <clears throat> so as, it, as the time thing went on, well, of course, I wrote, I wrote this book, that, uh, Out of the Darkness, in, 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 published in 1980. I tried to write it uh, several years before that, but my schoolwork was so heavy that I could not, I'd forget what I'd left off, and it was just too much interruption. So only after I retired from teaching, that I find time to write this book in a way that was co really coordinated. Now that's when the, the book itself that explains yes. what it was like a, a, at that time. Yeah. You, when you came to New Mexico, uh, this was, this was about one year after White Sands started. Yeah, that's off, right. That's it? right. Now I don't think most people realize that you, you worked for several years at White Sands nine before years. you nine years. Yeah. Before you came yes. down to, to the university? I was one of the, one of the pioneers. I had to, uh, the civil service, of course, is about half the crew, half military. And the head of the personnel office said to me, he said, I tried to wish you would write up the job descriptions of your men, different jobs, because we don't have any precedent before. We haven't the least idea how to write it. So I did that. I was one of the pioneers. And also, I was one of the co-designers of the small missile range. That's out here at White Sands. Yes. At that time, what was the difference? You, I'm sure you, you go out there now. In fact, I think you're planning on yes, going out yes. there the week after we do this show. Yeah, that's right. Uh, again, for more honors. General Fulwater is going to receive the uh, award this year. And he well deserves it. He's a very good uh, general. Now, I want you to go back, if you will, to mm -hmm. 19, was 1930. I guess the, uh, the discovery of Pluto was February 18th, yes. 1930. Yes. Let's lead up to that a little bit, if you can, because uh, some of the material you throw to me is almost mind-boggling. The one point there, I think you estimated you had looked at 90 million stars over a period of time. 14 uh, years. You also said that after the first year you've seen one star, you've, you've seen them all. But catch, catch that back for me, if you will. Let's go back there. Uh, what kind of a telescope were you oh, using? Uh, this uh, telescope was a wide-angle photographic telescope uh, with a low, low magnification in order to take in large part of the sky. For example, the moon's image on those plates is about the size of a dime. So it took a large area, but when you, you have to cover a lot of sky area. So you have to have a telescope that is short focal length, takes it a wide area of the sky on the plate, otherwise you can't cover the area fast enough. That was what the, we call that an astrograph. And uh, the one that they had there was one of the finest of, in the world. Now, this telescope was where? Isn't that the flagstaff of the 13-inch? That was that flagstaff. Yeah, it was a 13-inch. On the material you have in the book that is out of print now, mm -hmm. and uh, I'd love to, you know, it's almost, someone's just got to pick that up and say we're going to bring it back to print mm -hmm. because you can see the distance and just how small it is mm -hmm. that you had to work with to spot mm -hmm. Pluto, you know, to, to spot it at that time. How long after you felt that you had discovered it, did it take to get the kind of recognition that was needed to? It was uh, almost immediately after it was announced on the 13th of March, because the director, when he sent in the cablegram, or the, the, the telegram, announced it to the headquarters at Harvard, uh, to Shapley. <coughs> he told exactly where it was in the sky, and anybody wanted to could take photographs to look for themselves, and they didn't need to convince him. They could see it was what it was, what we said. It was right there. Yeah, it, 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 well, it, this was a refractor, yes. Short focal length, but a wide angle camera. And those are big 14 by 7 inch plates. There's something to handle. And I, I made a couple thousand of those. Now, people had to ask you, how'd you come up with the name? Oh, yes. Well, Pluto is the god of the lower world, and uh, where it's more dimly lit. And Pluto was out there so far off in the sun where it was dimly lit. So we thought that was an appropriate name. And uh, then, of course, when they found the satellite of Pluto uh, by James Christie, uh, he called it after, somebody after his wife's name, Charlene, 
called it Sharon. Sharon. Now Sharon was the name of the boatman who who rode the, who uh, took the souls of the uh, the souls across the river Styx to Hades. So it was well put together. So it's a very appropriate name. Now, um, I, I I found one thing interesting. I'm going back now uh, in my memory, but you remember it as well. Uh, as a very as a, as a young man, I felt I was a young man. A lot of other people didn't. But back in the early '60s, I came to Las Cruces, mm -hmm. and there was a move made to bring in a new newspaper. It was the Las Cruces American. Mm -hmm. And uh, since I had worked with the Olsa brothers in Washington D.C., uh, we picked up their column. Mm -hmm. And in the early '60s, the Russians launched a Sputnik. Mm -hmm. That's what they called it, the Sputnik. And the Osips came out with a column, which we ran in the paper right here, and it indicated that it was not really a Sputnik, that they were using reflectors to deceive people. I got a call from this gentleman, and he said, this is Clyde Tombaugh, and I sure would like to talk to you. And you came down and sat down with me and got chapter and verse on where the Russians were correct on this, and the column was wrong, and you said, I'd sure like you to, to correct that. Do you remember that period? Uh, somewhat, yes. And I'd never forget the morning of the thrill when I saw it visually in the sky before dawn. Uh, how, long after, how long after the first launch did you spot the Sputnik? About one, one day or so, one that night. Because as soon as we learned about it, we went out to watch to see if we could see it. Sure enough, it came across where they said it would. Exactly where they said it was. Pretty much so. You recognized at that time that yes. they weren't, that there was no deceit involved no deceit, in this. No deceit. There was none. I don't see how anyone could cook up anything false on that, the way it behaved. Well, the interesting thing was, and I give a credit to the also brothers because they corrected it also. Uh -huh. And I said, uh, the gentleman I've talked to is somewhat of an authority on this matter, and uh, he'll back up what he has to say. So they made the proper corrections. Mm -hmm. uh, I think everyone was, was fairly mm -hmm. happy all around on it. We're, we're, we've gone from like 1930, discovery of Pluto, took it up like to the, the Sputnik itself. You have been active at New Mexico State University. I don't know how your wife reacted in trying to find room for all the honors and awards that you've had. Uh, yeah, uh, quite a few of them. You, you have quite a few of them, and from, from all over the world, too. Uh, what, what I would like to check is in this period, uh, I would say like between 1960 and now, you know, we've had the, we, we, we really launched another step mm -hmm. into, into space. <laughs> uh, a professor of English once named G. Stuart Demarest made the comment, he says, poets make the best astronomers. Uh, he said, because they, they have creativity, they have vision, mm -hmm. and they can make these quantum leaps mm -hmm. that you have to make mm -hmm. to understand space. Mm -hmm. uh, I asked Patsy, I said, is uh, any chance as Professor uh, uh, Tomba a poet? She said, he's a punster, we know for sure. <laughs> but uh, how do you develop the kind of creativity today to understand, in your terms, what geography is like? in the well, rest of this space. I uh, was interested in my environment. I wanted to know what was on the other side of the mountain. And I just love geography and I love maps. And I could, at one time in about the fifth, sixth grade, I could bound every country in the world from memory. I knew it that well. And so then I had wanted, had wanted some new worlds to conquer, so I went to astronomy. And uh, of course that provided a good outlet for further study. And I got a great kick out of it. And so I've been learning ever since. Do you have, do you have other worlds that you want to conquer now? You know, you, have, you, you still, uh, you're as alert as you were 35 years ago. I wish I was as alert. Well, I think I decided to let the younger men do it now. But uh, I feel quite satisfied with what I did in my lifetime. Do you think, do you think you'd like to take a space trip? Have you ever, when you watch some of the people, we know we've known some of these fellows right from New Mexico that have gone up in space. Yeah. Have you well, thought about I, that? I, I realized I'd like to do that, but I realized I was too old. But the, the thought of, if they came to you and said, uh, Professor Tomba would like you to make this, space, you wouldn't well, have turned I, them down? They wouldn't have to. Oh, I would have turned them down because I wouldn't be able to take it. And that's a pretty strenuous uh, incident. And I wouldn't be able to take it at my age. 
What do you think we're going to look at now for the future? We're education, you know, we, we, the priorities that people talk about. And edu we always say education is our top priority, mm -hmm. yet after elections and things, it, it tends to sink to the bottom of the barrel. There are other priorities in there. Uh, where, where do you think we're headed in the kind of education we have? We need to explore the other side of this mountain, as you put it. Well, of course, as you know, they have two space probes being designed to send to Pluto. You know that. And I, don't, I won't live to see the outcome of that because it'll take 10, 12 years to get there. But uh, that'll give us more information about Pluto. And there's also a, a, a strong endeavor being made to detect planets around other stars. You, you may have heard of that. From the gravitational pull on the visible member. Uh, this isn't seen them directly, but it inferred that it exists there because of the gravitational influence. Uh, that is going to be pushed now considerably. And also, the, uh, perhaps the top of all is how the universe began, how about it end, uh, cosmology. Uh, there are several hypotheses, and uh, we, I don't think I've satisfied any of them. I don't think, uh, and I don't know that if we did know what it was, I'm not sure we could understand it. It's just too big. For example, is the universe finite? Well, uh, that's hard to imagine because the space curve itself, but what's outside of that? So you had a loss. Uh, is it infinite, goes on forever and forever? Well, that's hard to visualize too. So I am an uncomfortable dilemma on what to think about it. I don't know. Are you, uh, it's interesting to say that you're uncomfortable with what they're telling you is. Uh, and uh, what, uh, the, the Big Bang, I no longer believe, and for some time, because the distribution that you would expect from a Big Bang like that did not match the way I saw the galaxies distributed in my plates. It did not? No, it did not. I couldn't reconcile with the way they were distributed on the plates with the, with the central Big Bang. I, I've seen stories this very month that we're doing the show, you know, again, they're mentioning the Big Bang mm -hmm. as, as such as the, mm -hmm. the creation, creation of the world. Uh, if we lock ourselves into a theory like that too much, is that the reason we might not be able to, that we're, our own minds are too restricted that we can't? Yeah, I think, it does, I think it tends to do that. Now, I would say at the present time, <clears throat> probably about two-thirds of astronomers believe in the Big Bang. Well, I uh, discovered it several years ago and realized it implied things that I could not reconcile with what I had seen. And so I think eventually the time will come when they will abandon the Big Bang idea. We simply do not know. Now when we, I, I, I chuckled uh, when we were getting directions to come to the house again and uh, uh, I love to go, Patsy had said, uh, uh, well you can't miss it, here's the address, got good instruction, but there's a big telescope in the yard. Uh, when they say there's a telescope in the yard, that is a sizable telescope. Yes, you it. put that entire thing together yourself, didn't yes. you? Grinding I, I ground the mirror and polished it, put the parabolic figure on it. It's an F10 ratio, uh, about 15 feet long, and uh, bolted all the steel with bolts, hand bolted, to form the frame. There's about a ton of steel in that. And it works beautifully, just superbly well. I can use powers on them with sharp images on good nights as high as 700 diameters. Do you ever wonder when, you know, there, we always think, I, I went to a, a father-daughter camp, and uh, we were watching the, you know, sort of a, uh, the showers up there in the skies and lying down and, and feeling every arthritic rock in my back. And, uh, but I wondered about the, the poor people that live in some of the urban areas that probably never see stars. Yeah, you know, they, they never probably get, don't. Now, I had another question because, am I wrong that when you first spotted Pluto, it was in the afternoon? Yes. Now, people ordinarily would say, how can you, it's not dark yeah. enough to see it. Well, you see, they have the idea that I discovered at night looking through a telescope. It is impossible to find a planet like Pluto that way because you would have to watch each star for two hours before it had moved perceptibly to be visible. You can't do that for 100,000 stars. So it has to be photographic, you see, taken on two different dates. And then you have a third plate taken on a third date because you will get several faults and suspects and one kind or another, and you think, man, here's something. So you have to have a third plate to see if the image in the right place that fits the other. If it doesn't, throw it out. But and in the case of Pluto, it was confirmed. And it was, 
confirmed that it was spotted at four. I, I had it confirmed within the within about a half hour. Half an hour, and then in the afternoon. So they took one plate off, put the old one on, another one on, and there it was, uh, is exactly in the right place it's supposed to be. So that meant it that all the other, the, the, it was for real. You know, we uh, recently, I believe, uh, on top of all your other honors, uh, the Board of Regents at New Mexico State mm -hmm. University mm -hmm. uh, issued a proclamation just uh, on your behalf. It was a marvelous, uh, uh, marvelous recognition, but going yeah. back through all those years on your lectures uh, to when you first came down from, from uh, Kansas down mm -hmm. here. Uh, you did you establish the uh, Department of Astronomy? I had a big hand in it, yes. In New Mexico State? And not entirely of mine, but uh, had a, I played a big hand in it. And uh, you, you had stayed, uh, do you still maintain the emeritus? Uh, yes, uh, I still have the rank of emeritus professor. At the, at the university. Yes. Uh, how have they developed over the years? When, at Beautifully, they've expanded. They have a large uh, graduate school of astronomy. We, we, are, we have now given out 24 PhD degrees over the years we've been in existence, and about a dozen master degrees. And all our candidates, nearly all of them, have gotten very good jobs elsewhere. And they were trained out well, they were in demand. And we have a, a fine faculty. And so we're doing very well. And now that uh, Jack Burns is the head of the year, he, uh, then we get the big telescope up at the, in the mountains there, you know, at, at Apache Point. And uh, that's a big telescope. So they, uh, they, they've got, he has different people there who specialize in different areas of astronomy, and it makes a marvelous coverage of the whole thing. You can't know everything in everyone's astronomy because it's, it's like medicine. You have to specialize. Can anyone who's interested in space really carry that interest forward today without uh, the knowledge of astronomy as such, and space programs as such, without really having a good knowledge of astronomy? I think you need a good knowledge of astronomy. What about computerization now? You know, when you, well, you, you, use, you use computers, of course, to get the stuff results and analyze, but you, just, but you have to have a mental picture of what you're working with and a some sense of space and time, otherwise it's unintelligible to you. So you have to have that in order to have the imagination to see where you go next. Right, that's the imagination we had talked yes. about earlier, when the, the yes. poet's imagination. Yes. Did you know in your mind, did you know at the time that you were first looking? Uh, were you looking for Pluto? Oh yes, that was my job. It turns out that uh, uh, Percival Lowell had made a prediction that Pluto would be in the sky, and, and he changed the position drastically, and finally put it in eastern Taurus about where it would be Pluto. But now, now uh, they had been trying earlier years to find it, but without any success, and they weren't doing too thorough a job of it either. Uh, they uh, so uh, they had started early 1905, and of course uh, with the bigger telescope is a little easier, but it could have been found in 1915 that place. Uh, the Pluto was recorded on two of those plates in 19, taken in 1915, and they missed it. They couldn't, they, it was on the plate, but they didn't see it, or they, they, they missed it. They missed it. When you, when you do the scanning plates, you have to have a very strong mental concentration, otherwise you, get, you can't let your mind wander. You've got to be conscious of seeing every star image to see if it shifts. And that's very demanding. And so, uh, when I did the place, I got the place that I made that examined were taken. I took them in January of 1930, and the following month I got out. I take the do the examining during the full moon period, because with that telescope, you cannot take plates from the moons in the sky because it fog the plates. So, you you would have to take it. You say during the full moon period? No, no, no. no there's no moon in the sky no at moon. all. No moon in the sky. Even at all. the crescent moon would fog the plates. Just that light in the sky. Because uh, I was pressing it to the limit, you see, when our exposure. Can, you know, I've been, I've, someone said to me, now certainly this is not Patsy, uh, you're persistent. Uh, where do, what's the difference between being persistent? You've got to be pretty stubborn to yes, do that. Yes, and persevering. Persevering. Very that, persevering. That, that's probably the, the word we'll, we'll stick with, persevering. Also, I was somewhat of a perfectionist. And that's what you needed to refine the technique, the procedures, so as to be successful. I had that. Uh, in my temperament. You, you've got to feel very good about yourself, don't you? Yes. 
and the way you conducted your life. And I had worked out the geometry, and this is all my self-education. I hadn't been to college yet. I had worked out the geometry, mental geometry. In fact, I studied trigonometry as a hobby when I was in school on the farm because I didn't, couldn't get in high school. I studied trigonometry. How many people do that today to entertain themselves? Not very many. Well, I was interested in knowledge. And so, and of course, I was fascinated with what I saw in the sky. Can, uh, can I, was there something from your family, from the, uh, the parents and such, that, you know, th that's not, of course, there, there are a lot of things that kids have today that distract them, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, between TV and, and computers and such. They didn't have those distractions as a farm boy back there in Illinois and later in Kansas. Uh, can you attribute that thirst for knowledge to any particular person or? Yes, I had an uncle named, he lived near us in Illinois, and my uncle Lee, and he had a small telescope, and he was kind of sort of an amateur, and so I, uh, he helped me, and of course I was, the thing just appealed to me for some reason, and so I read everything I could get on the library zone on astronomy to, to learn more about it, and so that's the way I started out. And all my astronomy I knew when I went to Lowell was what I taught myself. You know, it's interesting, uh, Gerald Thomas, former president of mm -hmm. the university down here, once checked with a number of people and said, could you tell us, you know, can you tell us who the people were that, uh, that really made a big difference in your life? The same way you say, mm -hmm. my uncle Lee, who had mm -hmm. a telescope. Mm -hmm. There are children, young people all over this world who thank Clyde Tumbaugh for their interest mm -hmm. in it. I want to thank you for taking the time today to open your home to us. And You're very, very, very welcome. With all your good friends in New Mexico, I'm Ernie Mills with the person we consider a golden treasure for New Mexico, Clyde W. Tumba. I want to thank his bride, Patsy, for letting us into their home on this report from Santa Fe. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from U.S. West, providing advanced telecommunication services to New Mexico homes and businesses, and by New Mexico Tech on the frontier of science and engineering education. For bachelor's, master's, and Ph.D. degrees, New Mexico Tech is the college you've been looking for. 1-800-428-TECH.